Okay. Says I'm started, I guess. Okay, and it looks like it is recording. I see the flash at the top. Okay. I can't tell if anybody's coming in. I mean, it's not like having an individual session where I like get a waiting room or whatever, so I don't know. Okay, so we have 10 participants now. It's at the very bottom and it will say participants and there's a number beside of it. Okay, fun time. Yep. Are you ready for me to begin? You want me to wait until one? Um, you can go ahead and um, let's just wait till like right at one o'clock. I got one person okay. and she's trying to get in. It's interesting because it looks very different. I'm gonna open up my chat though so I can see in case people have questions. Okay. And I will also alert you and help build some of those. Okay, I've never done this dual before. I know. It, it's interesting. It's definitely different than the um, regular Zoom platform. Yeah, it says somebody is raising their hand. Okay. Destiny, I believe. Okay. It just came up and then went off. Okay. She might have accidentally hit it. Okay. And if anybody has any questions, um, you guys can enter them in the chat bar and I will be helping Amanda field some of these questions. And also be on the lookout for a survey at the end. Um, uh, well, actually tomorrow, an email will be sent out for um, a survey. And if you need credit hours, once you complete the survey, we will email you the um, certification. But the survey is required for the uh, state credits. All right, it's one o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and begin. Um, I'm Amanda Faggart. I work at Nazareth Child and Family. Um, and so my topic is parenting a child with special needs during a pandemic. Um, so I think I was picked because I have a child with special needs and I'm also a mental health and substance abuse counselor. So I have some unique um, dual roles there. So um, when I was asked to do this, the only thing I could think of was what a roller coaster it has been. Um, and I'm honestly very hopeful that we are on the downside of all that. Um, but, you know, this is kind of a crazy situation and we just don't know what's going to happen from month to month. Um, but when I think about the roller coaster, I also think about how a big chunk of this roller coaster was like taken away um, because school is very much an important part of my children's lives, even the children who do not have any neurological differences. Um, and so I think um, I saw this picture and I was like, that's the perfect example of what it feels like to be parenting a child with special needs during a pandemic. I'm on a roller coaster and half of it's missing and I have to just figure it out. Um, and so it's really been a journey, I think probably for most families, um, families with neurotypical children or families with autistic children or families with learning differences. I think it's been a journey and no one journey has been the same. Um, I do individual therapy with people all day long and I can promise you no journey has been the same. So um, I just thought that that was a good um, metaphor for kind of where we've been and possibly where we're going, who knows. So when I think about the pandemic, um, I, you know, like I said, I'm an individual therapist. And so I see lots of people and I think about kind of the degrees of stress that are on people. Um, and so these are three degrees of stress and only you, you know, can evaluate where you are. But um, stress is actually very good for us. It keeps us motivated. It makes us change. It um, 
increases the likelihood that we will keep moving towards a goal. Um, the problem is, is when we get too much stress, we no longer can move. Um, it kind of keeps us stuck. So there, I saw this degrees of stress and I thought it was really important that there are lots of positive things. You know, I think of, um, you know, like a couple getting married. That is a stressful event. Is it a positive event? Most of the time it's positive. I can't say all, but most of the time it's positive but it's stressful and there's lots to do and lots to get done and lots to keep moving forward. Um, I also think about like buying a house. There are all kinds of positive events that induce stress. And then there's like tolerable levels of stress where you have some positive, but there, there are some other things going on that makes it difficult. A lot of the time, this is where our support system comes into play. So we consider it, we consider stress tolerable when we have a big support system, when we have lots of folks around us, when we um, have people to ask questions of, when we get into trouble, those kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> my thoughts on that are, you know, we've just been through this pandemic where we've just, you know, told everybody, hey, don't go near your loved ones. Um, don't, you know, send your kids to school. Don't, do all these things where we are not able to support each other and ask for help and say, can you come over and just hang out with me for a little bit? And then there's toxic, <clears throat> which I kind of believe that a lot of us have been here for a little bit, um, or at least have been here. We've touched our foot in the water and we're on the way out, but it's just that intense prolonged stress. So where I don't know if y'all feel the way I did, but at the beginning of this, when it was, okay, we'll stay home for two weeks. It'll be two weeks. I was like, awesome, two weeks. I can't do anything. I can't run around. I'm not taking people anywhere. Two weeks is awesome. Well, you know, two weeks turned into three months and three months turned into four months. And so I think at some point, a lot of people crossed into that prolonged stress response because no longer were we thinking of it as a kind of mini vacation that we can get some projects done around the house or whatever, or just spend time with our family. It's now become, or what do we do if we don't have a job? What do we do if um, we can't get our kids the services they need? Um, and so then that stress can become toxic. And I think that a lot of people fell into that, at least some, um, during the pandemic. So when, you know, when we think about our bodies, we think about the degrees of stress that we're under. So, you know, when you define stress, it's, you know, fear, sadness, worry, numbness, frustration can come out of it. Um, we see changes in appetite, desire, and interest. Um, you know, we see all kinds of people say, I no longer want to do the things that I love, or even I have decided I'm no longer washing the dishes, or I'm no longer washing my clothes. Um, you know, I think those kinds of things start happening as things begin to feel too hard, where we feel stuck. Um, we see sleeping issues, um, you know, when the beginning of this pandemic hit, I was actually working a lot more, uh, whereas a lot of people were working less. Um, and so one of the things that I dealt with personally was like, okay, I haven't slept it in a while. And that's starting to like affect my ability to handle stress. Um, trouble concentrating, just staying on one task. And then those physical reactions, you know, stomach aches, headaches, those kinds of things that um, just come up. Um, what we see with people with prolonged toxic stress is that they have chronic health conditions that often come out of there. So, and you know, many, many studies have proven that heart issues, that um, digestive issues, even stuff as, you know, simple as, um, you know, getting more viruses or not being able to recover from viruses easily 
comes from being under chronic kind of toxic stress um, and increased use of substances. Um, we saw that across the board in the pandemic, um, just with people trying to get some little bit of escape, um, you know, and, you know, everything in moderation is kind of my uh, go-to statement. Um, and my kids hear me say it all the time when we're talking about sweets and things of that nature, but everything in moderation. And I think during a very stressful time period, we tend to um, do whatever it takes to make us feel good. So whether that means we're taking more naps or whether that means we're eating more sweets or whether that means we're, take, we're drinking more alcohol, um, those kinds of things increased. All right, do we have any questions? Like, make sure you ask me if, if you want to. Um, so um, what I focused on at the beginning of the pandemic was healthy ways to cope. Um, you would be very amazed at how many people do not know some very healthy ways to cope. Um, and it's, you know, if you have adults who don't know, it's hard to teach children, right? So, you know, deep breathing, and there are so many apps these days that have um, breathing exercises and those kinds of things um, to help reduce panic and anxiety. So that feeling of like you have to escape or that feeling of I'm like so nervous, I can't do fill in the blank, like going to grocery stores or stuff of that nature, like taking deep breaths and trying to get that regulated. Um, balance your eating. This one was really hard for me personally during the pandemic. Um, you know, just, I was at home more and I was just able to eat whenever I wanted to. When I'm in the office, I don't have the cupboard right there that I can just eat a Girl Scout cookie or whatever. Exercise, um, also hard during the pandemic. Um, gyms were closed. If you did not have access to having that in your house or being able to do that around your house, that was very difficult. Um, sleep, getting the right amount of sleep is important. So trying to make sure you're not staying up, you know, all night. Um, I definitely had a lot of teenagers who I called my vampires during this because they didn't have to go to school in the morning. So they would um, play video games all night long and then sleep during the day. Um, avoiding substances. So, you know, if you know that you are depending too much upon a substance like alcohol, you know, just avoiding that and continue routines. That I think was the most difficult for most people because some of our routines were kind of taken away from us. Um, no longer are we taking kids to school. No longer are we driving to OT. No longer are we doing those things. Um, and that was just kind of yanked right out. Um, and so continuing routines that are important for you around your household. So um, I think like at the beginning of this, I went like four days without washing my clothes. And I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but for a family of five, there's a tremendous amount of clothes to catch up on. And it was just because I thought, well, I have all the time in the world because I'm going to be here all the time. But that one thing got me to be like, oh, that, that's making me very anxious now that I have all this laundry. And so if I just keep it going on a routine and you know, I fall into these traps just as easily as everyone else does. Um, and so I think that, you know, making sure that you keep your routines is so important, even when life is changing very quickly. Um, Self-care is an important one. Um, and that does not, you know, when people think about self-care, they think about like going to get massages and um, getting their nails done or whatever. Um, but that really can be very simple. That can be going out and gardening. That can be um, taking a walk around the neighborhood. It doesn't have to cost any money. That can be watching your favorite TV show. 
that can be taking time just to like chat with your spouse or your loved one, um, that kind of thing and connect with community. And I think that's been the hardest one. Um, I do know that lots of people have used Zoom to connect. Um, and I think, you know, we've been very lucky that technology is where it is because we were able to use Zoom to connect. Um, and I think that that's so important when you're dealing with a high stress, high, you know, need environment. All right. So children in stress. So children look a little different than adults do. Not all, but some uh, children look a little different. So some of the more behaviors we see in children are different than adults. So when you have irritability in children, you know, we think about adults being irritable and they may snap at you, but ir irritability in children may be acting out. So, you know, they may be having fits or having temper tantrums or doing something they know that they're not supposed to do. Um, I know for my particular kiddo, um, doing the uh, virtual learning was very difficult for her and she would really let us have it when it came time to do the Zooms and all that stuff. She was not feeling that. So she would have herself a major meltdown. Um, and I knew it was all about control. And so I was able to just let her have her moment and then come back to her and say, are you ready now? And she could usually get herself together. Um, we worked really hard on that, by the way. Um, when we talk about children with worry, what we see is, um, you know, my stomach hurts. You, you hear all about, you know, oh, my stomach hurts. I don't want to go to school or my stomach hurts. I can't do anything. Um, headaches. Children complain of a lot of headaches. Um, they also um, complain of a lot of like, oh, my legs hurt or my knees or my ankles, um, you know, like things that you would not necessarily think would be attributed to anxiety are very much attributed to anxiety. So just being kind of aware of that and not, you know, freaking out when our kids say, oh, my ankle hurts. Okay, well, tell me about what's going on today or tell me about what's happening for you today. Um, sadness, you know, we see crying. Um, we see that kind of across the board with children and adults. Um, but, you know, with kids, a lot of times that crying is more, especially kids with special needs, the crying is more meltdown level crying. Um, one of the things that um, my child particularly does is when she gets really sad, she starts to talk about every sad event that has ever happened to her in her life. It's a fun process. Um, so all of a sudden we're sad because we can't, we had our Disney trip canceled. So we can't go to Disney. And so for days and days and days, she was super sad because they can't, you know, they closed it and she just went through all the sad events. So then we had to talk about our dog dying. Then we had to talk about how sad it was one time that she had to get a flu shot. She hates shots anyway. So it just went over and over again. And at some point that gets kind of exhausting. Um, and so, you know, we sometimes take a break from that emotion. So I'll say, Abby, and I'm going to use her name here because, you know, whatever. Uh, but I'll say, Abby, we need to take a break from that emotion. What can we do that's fun? What can we do that makes you feel happy? What can we do that makes you laugh? Um, because if not, she will keep going um, down that kind of sadness path or anger path or whatever path that is. So we try to take a break from that emotion. Um, regression. This is the one that I've seen all over the place. Um, almost all the parents that I see have complained about this. Uh, a ton of kids that I see are having this happen. I saw it in my own kids, you know, neurologically um, typical or not. <laughs> um, just the desire to be with me all the time, the 
um, not wanting to, for um, my um, autistic uh, daughter, it was not wanting to use the bathroom again, not wanting to do the things that we pretty much had under control um, prior to the um, pandemic. So, and oh, not wanting to take her medicine, not wanting to, I mean, not wanting to do age appropriate things, talking like a baby. We had like a real big issue with that where she, who is, I mean, you know, she's eight years old and she started using very baby talk, um, small, she's verbal and she was just using very small things and, and really getting upset when you couldn't understand what she wanted. Those kinds of things that aren't typical behavior for her were happening a lot more. Um, and honestly, in all of my kids, they no longer want to be alone to sleep. So they're all three sleeping in one bedroom. I got bedrooms for each kid. They're all sleeping in one bedroom right now. It's just one of those things that I cannot fight and I'm not willing to fight. So they're all doing that and that's fine, whatever. Um, but nobody wanted to be alone with sleep anymore. So it's those kinds of things that we see with children and stress and they are super smart and they can feel it when the adults are stressed. Um, and so I think that's like a really important thing for people to know is that your, your child, you know, is feeling the adult stress in the room, um, even if they're not commenting on it. All right, so how to support your child. Um, you know, when we're going through any kind of stressful situation, pandemic or not, <laughs> um, you talk about it. Um, I think a lot of times when I see parents, they want to ignore <laughs> because they think it will go away. Or I hear this one a lot. It's just a phase. It's just a phase. And maybe it is just a phase. That could be totally true. But you have to talk about it. It's important. It's important that they learn to communicate. If they're not verbal, it's important that you model communicating at the same time, um, giving lots of reassurance. Um, you know, one of the things um, that's really important is to give lots of positive messages when things are really stressful. Um, I'm not talking about being disingenuine. I'm talking about saying, I really like how brave you were when we had to do this, this, and this. Um, validation. This is a hard one for most parents. Um, it's honestly hard sometimes for me too. And I validate all day, every day. Um, but when my kids overreact to something, or I think they're overreacting to it, um, I tend to be dismissive and that's not helpful. So, um, it's really important that you say, this looks like this is hard for you. Um, I, I understand that this is tough. Um, can we figure out a way to make it better? So it's important that you validate that it's a tough time, it's a hard time, or it's a stressful thing before you offer solutions. Because think about it even as an adult, you want someone to hear you first before they offer solutions. Um, children are the same way. They want you to understand that it's hard. Um, making time. Uh, so making time is hard. Um, I have multiple children with multiple different things going on. Um, each of them requires different things. Um, and making time is hard. Um, so just being very intentional about the time you take and the time that you're with them and being very present the times that you are. So that may be not answering your cell phone during dinner. That may be playing a board game. That may be just going outside um, and hanging out with them. Uh, my kids love it when I get on the trampoline. They love it. Now, granted, hopefully I don't fall, but um, they love it when I do that stuff because it's investing in something that they really like um, and they want me to be a part of. Um, limit the exposure to media. 
at the very beginning of all this, and it's still pretty intense media wise, but at the very beginning of all this, all they talked about was death and, you know, how many people have it and how many people are getting it. Um, and it was very scary. It was scary for us adults. Um, and so if kids are watching the news, that can really, you know, make them very stressed and when they're talking about you know death and dying on the tv all the time um take care of your own mental health um so that's super important because what you value your kids will want to value too because if you model that so i've had um lots of people come into therapy recently who said i just think my kids need to understand that this is what you do when you're struggling, when you're feeling depressed, when you're feeling anxious, you know, you do something about it instead of just allowing it to take over. Um, and modeling that is super important. Okay. So what we know from the pandemic in general is that um, 93 percent of countries around the world are reporting an increased need for mental health services. So this is from uh, the World Health Organization. They're the end all be all for this kind of statistics. Um, and so they're seeing it across the board. So this is not something that just is happening for American children or for American, you know, um, people. It's Across the board, people need more mental health services. Increased in substance abuse, we're seeing a lot of overdoses, um, which is terrifying. And, you know, I think I'll, at least some of you uh, work at Partners, if not most of you. Um, but I know that you see kids who have been affected by parental drug use. Um, and so that is a big deal. Um, this is one that I think is important too: stigma in leaving quarantine or having suspected exposure. So I think what we didn't really, you know, think about was how people were going to feel about being contagious. Um, you know, and so if you've been exposed, you can no longer go to school. If you, um, have had it, what is it like coming back to school um, you know, previous to this, the, you know, the only thing that stigma wise you could really talk about was like, like, and it's not similar to, but the stigma wise, like AIDS, like, you know, people were like back in the eighties, they were like, Ooh, don't touch that person, you know, that kind of thing. But this was similar to that kind of stigma, um, for the virus because the fear was so present. Um, in our kids, in, in our adults. Um, the long-term effects on education, especially for children with special needs. So, you know, that loss of structure and routine, I would argue for neurotypical kids was tough. For our kids who have special needs, it was almost debilitating at times. Um, and so I think that's important for us to recognize all of these things are affecting our children. Let's see. So when I think about all of those things, the, the thing that comes up to me most is the power of connectedness and finding ways to connect with your loved ones. Um, so thankfully, a lot of families were doing Zooms. A lot of families were sitting outside six feet away from each other you know, especially in March, April, May of last year, when things were so, you know, intense, you know, at least it was nice outside and they can, you know, meet and be distant and be socially distant. Do service activities, especially now as things are getting less intense, you, you can do more service kinds of things and finding purpose in the crisis. The biggest reason we have people who seek um, mental health services is because they feel like they have no purpose in their job or their marriage or their families. 
So it's figuring out what your purpose can be. Um, and we've heard all kinds of stories all over, you know, the news about, you know, children making lemonade stands to, you know, make money for such an, I mean, you know, all kinds of things because finding purpose in the crisis is a really important way to motivate and keep people moving. Um, all right, so special needs children and accommodations. So if you're like me, I, I like to hear the word accommodation because it means they're gonna help me with something. It means that somebody's gonna say, let's try to figure this out. Um, so one of the things that, you know, someone has said to me way back when, um, and my daughter was diagnosed, um, we started the process when she was 14 months old. Um, because she was doing some behaviors that were not neurotypical. Um, and somebody said to me when we were going through a particularly hard time with doing some testing and things of that nature, you are the expert on your child. So if you know that this is not gonna work or if you know that something that a doctor or a health professional is doing is not gonna work, then tell them. Um, one of the things that I did early on, because my daughter had to have physical therapy, I tried to warn people, um, especially the physical therapist, please don't touch her until she's ready for you to touch her. Um, because it touch is such a sensitive thing for her. And I'm like, don't reach out, don't reach out to touch her until she's ready. Um, because then she won't deal with you forever. And I had to you know, fire's the wrong word, but I had to tell some physical therapist, she's not going to deal with you anymore. So there's no reason for you to come to our house because you touched her before she was ready. Um, so it's those kinds of things that you can warn people about and talk to people about um, so that they can make the right call and can help you better. Um, and so keeping a schedule, um, this was really hard. I think um, during the pandemic, like, you know, at the beginning for sure. And I think I'm doing better now at that, but keeping a schedule for meals, medication, sleep and school. So, um, you know, meals happening around the right time. Uh, you know, my kid will get hangry um, and she will have a meltdown because she's hungry. And it took us a long time to figure out that that was the, that was the issue. Um, and, you know, my child specifically does, is not verbal when she's upset. And so she's not going to tell me what the problem is. If she's gotten to that level, you know, it's your guess is as good as mine at that point. Um, medication, keeping medication the same time instead of kind of being willy nilly with it. Um, sleep was really hard because my kids were like, we don't have to get up to go to school in the morning. So let's, let's stay up late. It's light out. Let's stay up late. No, no, you have to go to school. It's just virtual school. Um, and when they do schoolwork, um, and giving lots of breaks because in the real, in the, in the real, in the real school day, they get lots of breaks transitioning from one thing to another, um, going outside, having exploratory classes. So they get a lot of breaks. Um, and what some parents were trying to do is get schoolwork done as quickly as they could, um, which I get a hundred percent. I get, I'm a parent too. So I get that, but that's not good for kids focus and being able to maintain that over time. Schedule quiet time to avoid sensory overload. Um, so we are getting better at this, uh, but it's not, this one's not that, mm, it's just not an easy one for us to do because she needs more quiet time than say my neurotypical child or, um, or myself for that matter. So there are times when I know that she's been highly anxious where I'm like, let's, let's do something quiet. Let's go sit on the back porch. Um, and those kinds of things. And, you know, I'm a therapist, so I want to talk everything to death, like, you know, um, but sometimes she just needs quiet and a moment. Um, 
whether that's with her weighted blanket um, or whether that's hanging upside down. We have a trapeze in our house. It's a long story. It was suggested by the occupational therapist and uh, to be fair, it has worked wonders. And so we have a trapeze that's in her door frame and she hangs upside down like a bat for a really long time. Um, and that's how we know that she is just trying to reboot herself um, and even my other children, cause she's my middle, my other children don't bother her during that time period. Cause they just know, you know, she's doing her thing. Um, praise, you know, I understand that these zooms are really hard for you. Um, I'm really proud of you for sticking with it. Um, and you know, talking to teachers about what are the difficulties with this situation or what, what has come of this situation. Correct and redirect behavior. We always want to do this um, because we can't just allow kids to do whatever they want. Otherwise they don't learn to be good adults um, or healthy adults. Um, but knowing when to do it. Um, this is always a thing for my husband and I, because he wants to address it right then and there, whatever the behavior is. Um, and I will say to him, um, you can't address it right now. She can't hear you. She can't hear a word you're saying. And it bothers him. Um, but it's true. You know, if she's already overwhelmed and overloaded, she is not able to hear any of that. And so anything you're doing, it could be the best parenting strategies you've ever seen before. And it won't work because she's not capable of listening to you or hearing it. So planning transitions. Uh, this one's so, so hard because, you know, for neurotypical children, that's not as a, that's not as difficult as a thing. Um, and for adults, we kind of expect our kids to get up and move when we tell them to move. Um, and transitions are really difficult for, for special needs kids um, because they have to plan and they have to know what to expect and they have to not be scared. Um, so one of the things that we have done for years and years and years, and if you can tell, we've done OT since she was itty bitty, um, is use transition objects. Um, so she has specific things that she will take with us um, that help her feel calm and help her feel um, stable. These are not things like um, chewy necklaces and those kinds of things, like things that you feel like are fidgets or are made for them. These are things that she wants to take. Um, that she feels comfortable with. Sometimes it's a chip clip, like a literal chip clip, um, but she likes it and she likes to open it and close it, open it and close it. Um, so some of them are not even like what I would consider made as a transition object. It's just something that she really likes and she feels safer with. Um, it also helps her not to have to make eye contact. If she is going into a situation where she's very uncomfortable and wants to look at this transition object, she can kind of divert the attention from her face to the transition object. Um, and so I always let her take, you know, whatever it is um, into wherever we're going. And there, there are situations where I know are going to be very, overstimulating and I make sure to have those things. All right, providing control. This is my middle child right here. When we finally did go to, go to Disney World um, <laughs> this last spring break, um, she does not love crowds. Um, she does not love loud noises. She does not love really anything about Disney World, to be fair, um, except she does love um, Stitch, and she does, and we went to Universal this time, too, because my oldest is really into Harry Potter, and she does love Minions, um, and so there are things that we did already to make her feel more comfortable. Um, she is my little germ, 
my little germaphobe anyway, prior to all of this, she's very sensitive with her hands and her feet. Um, and so she does a lot of hand washing anyway, but that became really important when we went to Disney or when we go out to like Target and especially during COVID, um, she really wants to wash her hands very thoroughly, like, like a surgeon washes his hands or her hands. So I allow her to do that. And we all just know it's going to happen. Even my other kids are like, well, you know, we have to take a break so Abby can wash her hands. Um, and she does. Um, she, you know, we avoid crowds if we can. Um, you know, and thankfully, there, you can use a disability pass at Disney, which was helpful. Um, but we avoid them where we can. Um, and there are things that she just doesn't want to do. Um, she often will not go to a birthday party because she just feels uncomfortable. So, you know, she there were parts of the pandemic that she really kind of dug. She was like, this is cool. I, I'm okay with this social distancing thing. Um, accessories that make her comfortable. Um, she loves to wear a hat and sunglasses all the time. Um, and she uses earphones pretty regularly but she's a little sensitive about the way they look. So we have gotten to where we use earplugs. Um, and so that has been super helpful. Um, and especially, you know, using the iPad when we need to, when we know it's something that she wants to kind of avoid and kind of stay out of, if that makes sense. Um, and she uses her hat and she'll tell people that her hat is so she doesn't have to look at you, so. Um, modeling behaviors that are healthy, especially during a pandemic, wearing your mask. I mean, these kids have to wear masks all the time. You know, for me, I want to make sure that she understands that I'm doing it too, and that it's not the most fun thing, but we're all doing it. Um, waving instead of, you know, touching, which for her, she is not about the touching but we're trying to convince her to do the waves um, and just keeping six feet distance during the whole thing. Um, funny story, she is very sensitive about the Corona rules. And when she gets very anxious, she will start hollering coronavirus rules to people. So if someone's close to her, she'll be like, this is not six feet. This is not social distancing. I need you to back up. Um, so we're working on being polite when she's asking for those things. Um, uh, but it's one of those things that those rules provide her with a lot of control and a lot of comfort. Um, and so knowing that that provides that kind of safety for her, and it really is a safety. If you stay six feet from me, we're good. Let's see. Treatment planning. Um, identify caregivers for breaks. Um, so I think this one is so huge. Um, there are people that my daughter will deal with and there are people that she will not deal with. Um, and they can be family members and she will still not deal with them. So it's identifying people who she feels are safe um, and being okay with the fact that she doesn't feel like everybody's safe. Um, and taking breaks when it's needed. Um, I think that's huge. Um, doing the essential services. I don't know. Lots of people were doing telehealth. I started doing telehealth myself with my clients. Um, we did telehealth for occupational therapy because um, not that I don't think she was gaining a tremendous amount from being um, telehealth, but she missed her occupational therapist so much that she just wanted to talk to her. So most of those sessions were just her talking to her because she missed her so much and she would cry and get very upset. Um, you know, she's been seeing this one therapist since she was under two. Um, and so this person is her, you know, safety net. So we did do some telehealth there. The virtual visits, I, you know, if they were worth it, we would do it. If they were not, we wouldn't. So um, there were Zooms that her classmates were doing 
that were just for fun, like just to meet up and talk about their, you know, whatever. Abby did not want any part of that. It was loud. Um, there was not a lot, especially at the beginning, there was not a lot of control over who was talking when. Um, and it got to be very frustrating. So we just sent the teacher an email and said, we're not doing these Zooms that are not educationally important because it's too stressful. Attending regular appointments when you can. Um, the thing about kids with special needs and even, you know, kids without is that, you know, physical presence is important when you're little. Um, it's easier to do virtual stuff with adults, but physical presence is so important because they're hands-on and they want to touch you and they want to be with you. Um, and letting go of unreasonable expectations for your child and for yourself. There is um, there is nothing more that you can do that's good for yourself than to let go of unreasonable expectations. You know, there are things that we just don't expect her to do. Um, you know, there are things that are really difficult for her that she's not ready to do. Um, and so we don't, we don't push that. Um, you know, if our other children all want to go and do something and we feel like Abby's going to be miserable. We don't force it, um, you know, and simplify life where you can, you know, give downtime and chill time where you can. Um, the running, running, running sometimes is hard. Um, avoid isolation. So how do you find and maintain support networks when support networks are um, not as available? Um, I think Partners in Learning does a fabulous job of um, getting support systems in the community and that kind of thing. But taking part in some of that is super important. Um, because it's not always easy to put yourself out there. Um, I'm kind of an open book and have always been an open book with pretty much everyone I meet. Um, but I know that that's not easy for a lot of other people. Um, and so just finding people who can kind of be your support system and be your tribe and have your back. Um, and um, not get embarrassed when they're, you know, there are certain behaviors that come out in public or whatever. Um, I think as a mom, that support of other moms who are like, it's okay, that's just Abby, you know, as she does something that I'm like, oh God, did she just do that? Did she just yell at that woman for not wearing her mask? Yes, yes, she did. I mean, so it's those kinds of things that having your friends who are like, it's okay. That woman should be wearing her, you know, like that kind of thing where I'm not so like tense all the time. Um, because you know, she doesn't have a filter. She says what she wants. Um, so yeah, so I think those are all important things. Um, and just knowing who your child is and knowing what you can push and then what to back off on. Um, is important. And I sometimes miss the mark with that too. So, um, you know, there are times where I will push and it will explode. And my husband will be like, now, you know, <laughs> and I'll be like, okay, so I was pushing, but there are times where I push and she does really well. And I'm like, look at what she's done a year ago. She wouldn't have been able to do that. So, you know, all of that. I think that might be it. Yeah, so those are the resources that I got um, a lot of the information from. You got a lot of stories about my own personal life. That's kind of how I roll. Um, and yeah, I think the, the biggest takeaways are find your supports, take care of your mental health, um, and, you know, try to accommodate where you can. Um, and provide structure where you can. So I guess that's it. Do we have questions? It's so weird to be presenting without seeing people's faces, by the way. It's weird. 
You did a wonderful job, Amanda. Thank you so much for all the great insight and also the resources that you provided that are evidence-based resources and accurate information. So we appreciate that. Um, we'll give people a few minutes to write their questions in the chat bar or to raise their hand. And again, as just a reminder, if you need uh, training credit hours for this presentation, tomorrow you'll receive an email with a survey. Please complete that survey. And at the end of the week, we will email you your training certificate. All right. Well, if y'all have any questions, just holler at me. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Oh, we All do right. thank you. Oh, oh. Thank you. oh, it was oh. just thank you. Okay. <laughs> All, All right. right. Thanks. Bye.